Hey everyone, I appreciate you guys taking your time to listen. I really do believe that today we will leave this presentation with a better understanding of an issue that affects us all, from strength and conditioning to medical to coaching. Um, I do believe this presentation will enable us to be a better team. I'd like to start with a simple video. As we watch this video, I want you to pay attention to some key characteristics. Look at the time. There's about five minutes left in the fourth quarter. This is a 2012 game between OSU and Baylor. And the running back, C. Strunk, is rushed for 178 yards, uh, including this 76-yard touchdown. The game is being played in December in Waco, Texas. Temperature from this period was anywhere from 43 to 58 degrees. C. Strunk experiences a cramp during his run. We're all familiar with this episode and also understand how much or how such an occurrence can impact us all. As a strength and conditioning professional, we understand uh, how this can be limiting to the athlete's performance. As trainers, we understand how a simple muscle cramp can lead to a cascade of events that ultimately leads to injury. And as medical staff, we understand how the methodologies in preventing against such an issue uh, may have an importance to our profession. For the coaches, we must consider uh, a famous quote by Bill Parcells. He says that half the games on any given Sunday in the NFL are determined by seven points or less. And a half of those games are determined by three or four points. As you can imagine, for such a small difference, every adjustment we can make to improve the performance of our, of our athletes from beginning to the end of the game is of great importance. Taylor would go on to win this game with a score of 41-34. to Unfortunately for Seastrunk, he was able to walk away without much of an issue. However, exercise-associated muscle cramps are present and a real issue. As you're watching this vi video, I want you to consider another story. Again, this is just an observation, but essential for some of the points that will be made from this presentation. It's the fourth quarter. We're down by seven playing against a division rival, and our star receiver, who has been leading in receptions targets, is beginning to feel the sensation of cramps in his lower calves. He calls out for a drink, takes two swigs, and heads out onto the field for a play. QB snaps the ball, receiver gets a quick release, runs a quick slant, catches the ball before being tackled. It's a gain of four. He looks up from the tackle, and as he jogs into the huddle, his characteristic gait begins to shift. He's limping. He looks to be in pain. He stops, and he rubs his lower leg before being forced to return to the sideline. Dan, I'm cramping. Despite my understanding of nutrition and digestion, specifically that an athlete can uh, ingest over just over one gram of carb per minute per hour, my focus was to make sure that this athlete still drank as much as possible. I was still operating from the perspective of dehydration and electrolyte imbalance as the ultimate cause of exercise-associated muscle cramps. Don't blame my reaction as I sat there observing his calf muscle ballooning and then relaxing at almost a rhythmic pace. I went into my instincts and relied on previously understood information. Despite a great focus on nutrition and hydration by the team, by our training staff, and myself, I view greater hydration or more liquid intake uh, as, as an opportunity to resolve the issue. More liquid, more salt would resolve this issue. This was the line of thought for many games during that season. However, recent research has challenged this line of thought. Science and experience have forced me to review and challenge this typical response. I can no longer rely on that method of response when the game is on the line and our fatigue star is down, he's suffering from exercise-associated muscle cramps. I want to make sure that we address the challenge of return to play correctly and efficiently. Today we will review exercise-associated muscle cramps. This presentation is not meant to support any one method of treatment for exercise-associated muscle cramps. It's simply meant to invite discussion to an issue that, although very common, still lacks a true consensus in terms of protocol and method of prevention. Ultimately, however, I would like to establish a pro proactive plan with scientific support for the management of athletes who suffer from exercise-related muscle cramps. So what are today's objectives? Today, uh, I hope to provide the following information. I want to provide a definition of exercise-associated muscle cramps. Uh, I'd like for us to understand the two prevailing theories for the cause of exercise-associated muscle cramps. I'd like to shed some light on the characteristics of exercise-associated muscle cramps. And I'd like to review some scientific evidence, understand the risk factors of exercise-associated muscle cramps, uh, provide ideas for suggested prevention methods and treatment, and summarize findings uh, and provide some, some key takeaways.
So what is exercise associated muscle cramps? Well, it's been described as painful, spasmodic, involuntary contractions of the skeletal muscle during or immediately after physical exercise. It's also been described or defined as cramps that occur in healthy individuals with no underlying metabolic, neurological, endocrine pathology after physical exercise. It's important for us to, to really sort of understand the common characteristics of exercise-associated muscle cramps. So first, let's start with the location. While exercise-associated muscle cramps can occur anywhere, they chiefly occur in working muscles that cover multiple joints. So with regard to a running sport such as NFL football, consider important lower body muscle groups such as the quadriceps, particularly the rectus femoris, which crosses at both the hip and the knee, the hamstrings, uh, such as the biceps femoris, which crosses at both the hip and the knee, and the gastroc, which crosses at the knee and the ankle. These characteristics are important to consider as we cover the causes of exercise-associated muscle cramps, especially one of the leading theories. Now remember, these muscles cover many joints and have the potential for shared functions, such as assisting with flexion or assisting with hip flexion, and a greater ability than single joint muscles to lengthen and shorten. This is going to be an important characteristic as we go through the causes of exercise-associated muscle cramps. Another characteristic to consider is exercise-associated muscle cramps is associated with, with sports of high intensity. It's much more prevalent in athletes who exercise at rel relatively vigorous intensity. So consider our athletes who operate at high intensities. Uh, they generally occur towards the end of sport, um, and it seems to be common in sports. Uh, among the most common conditions that require medical intervention, we've seen uh, research that supports it's, it occurs 67% in triathletes, between 30 and 50% of marathon runners, and 52% of rugby players, which have very much similarities between uh, that sport and football. Now that we're familiar with the characteristics of exercise-associated muscle cramps, it's important to consider the cause. Currently, there are two popular theories for exercise-associated muscle cramps. The two theories are the dehydration and electrolyte imbalance theory and the altered neuromuscular control theory. The dehydration and electrolyte imbalance theory uh, pretty much states that the extracellular fluid compartment becomes contracted due to sweating, leading to a loss of volume. This sweating can lead to sodium, calcium, magnesium loss, and results in, in sort of a change, a me mechanical deformation of nerve endings. Uh, and also, with, with respect to that, there's also sort of a change in the ions concentration leading to uh, the result of nerve endings being hyper-excitable, um, capable of a spontaneous discharge. So essentially, a loss in cell volume paired with a change in ion concentration leads to deformation and excited nerves. And then there's the altered neuromuscular control theory. The altered neuromuscular control theory, one of the most popular theories, popularized by a researcher named Martin Schwalness, who studies out of the Research Unit for Exercise Science and Sports Medicine out of the University of Cape Town in South Africa. He says that exercise-associated muscle cramps result from altered reflex control mechanisms in response to neuromuscular fatigue. He states that muscle overload and fatigue create an imbalance of excitatory drive from muscle spindles and the inventory drive from Golgi tendon organs. This imbalance leads to an increase in excitatory drive to the author motor neuron, which ultimately produces a localized cramp. In other words, muscle overload can cause fatigue and disrupt the normal balance that occurs between the muscle spindles and the Golgi tendon organ. Remember, the Golgi tendon organs are responsible for inhibiting muscle contraction. This imbalance results in greater excitation and less inhibition, resulting in a cramp at the localized region. Despite the popularity of the altered neuromuscular theory in the scientific community, it seems that protocol, the steps we take to prevent or treat exercise-associated muscle cramps, operates out of the dehydration electrolyte imbalance theory. For some of us in preparations for game competitions, that may take the form of us salt loading prior to competition. We may make assumptions about an individual's hydration levels when they do suffer an exercise-associated muscle cramp. And when treating exercise-associated muscle cramps, the common response is to focus on greater hydration. Now, I'm not saying this method is without its benefits in terms of improved performance as well as decreased time to fatigue. However, science seems to lend much more support towards the altered neuromuscular theory as a cause of exercise-associated muscle cramp. Therefore, we should look to promote prevention strategies, protocol, and treatments that are based on the altered neuromuscular theory.
In order to progress into effective preventative strategies and effective treatment, we must build on the scientific evidence that is based on the causes of exercise-associated muscle cramps, rather than continue practices that lack scientific strength. The following studies provides evidence for the strength of the altered neuromuscular theory and also poses challenges to the dehydration electrolyte theory. More importantly, these studies gives us the opportunity to understand risk factors associated with exercise-associated muscle cramps. So in these next few slides, I'm, I'm just going to review some of the research that supports the altered neuromuscular uh, control theory. And I'm also going to provide some evidence that really sort of goes against the dehydration electrolyte imbalance theory. All right. uh, there are a few factors that seem to, to challenge the support for the dehydration theory. In fact, when we look at the literature, there are a few questions for which the dehydration theory offers limited answers to. For instance, uh, why does stretching help relieve cramps? All right, this, is, uh, this was a quote by Martin Schwellness in 1997, uh, and it seems to challenge a premise that a dehydration and electrolyte imbalance results in exercise-associated muscle cramps. He says, the plausibility of hydration status and electrolyte concentration is causing um, muscle cramps also seems questionable, as is often relieved by stretching of the affected muscles or by activation of the Golgi tendon organ. These treatments would certainly be incongruous for a condition mediated by electrolyte deficit and dehydration. Uh, another question to pose and really sort of offers limitation to the dehydration theory is why are cramps site-specific? In other words, why, why are they localized in some region? Why do you get it in your arm or your, your leg, uh, your, your, in, in some of these uh, multi-joint muscle groups? Um, here's a quote by uh, Nicole Nelson out of the University of North Florida. Um, the systemic nature of electrolyte deficits and dehydration does not explain the fairly consistent presentation of cramping only within working muscles. Uh, she also notes that most dehydration studies have, uh, have been really sort of designed poorly. Uh, they're, they're based on observational uh, sort of models where causation cannot necessarily be inferred due to potential confounding factors. Um, uh, during the days of testing, study, part, study participants uh, do not demonstrate exercise-associated muscle cramp. Um, sample sizes are small and a list of other factors. On the other hand, the literature for altered neuromuscular theory is a bit stronger. In a 2004 study investigating muscle cramps in ultra-distance runner, researcher Martin Schwalner says dehydration is loosely affected with muscle. There are no clinically significant alterations in serum electrolyte concentrations, and there is no alteration in hydration status in runners with muscle cramps. Here's another study by researchers out of South Africa investigating runners and running intensity state their findings. They conclude that the result from the study add to the evidence that, that dehydration and altered serum electrolyte balance are not causes of muscle cramps. Rather, endurance runners competing at a fast pace suggest that they exercise at high intensities are at risk for muscle cramp. Dr. Gavin Shang in the 2010 study looking at the, the factors states there is evidence from this study that a history of exercise muscle cramps is associated with exercising at a higher intensity during a race, and that may result in premature muscle fatigue and an inherited risk, uh, positive family history, as well as a history of tendon and or ligament injury. It does not mention uh, dehydration as one of the causes. Uh, researchers at the University of Sydney also add further evidence to the altered neuromuscular theory in, two, in a 2007 study investigating muscle inhibition techniques. They say that muscle cramps can be inhibited by stimulation of tendon afferents in the cramped muscle. In the same study, these researchers state, when the strength of tendon inhibition in cramping subjects was compared, it is likely that the reduced inhibitory feedback from tendon afferents has an important role in generating cramps. Again, this research does not seem to help support the dehydration electrolyte imbalance theory. Uh, it seems that muscle fatigue is the root of issues when we discuss Muscle cramps. Kevin Miller, a researcher out of the University of North Dakota, summarizes a common finding when researchers investigate the cause of muscle cramps. It has been observed that runners who develop muscle cramps almost exclusively report a subjective feeling of muscle fatigue before the onset of muscle cramps. Researchers also demonstrate that the intensity of exercise also plays a role in muscle cramps, further supporting the altered neuromuscular control theory. In a 2010 study published by the Brit British Journal of Sports Medicine's research to state the development of exercise mus associated muscle cramps was associated with faster predicted race times and faster actual race times despite similarly matched preparation performance histories in subjects from both groups. Lastly, 
A characteristic of the golden tendy organ offers greater insight and support for the altered neuromuscular control theory. Researchers have determined that when skeletal muscles contract in a shortened position, there is depressed signaling from the Golgian tendon organ, which explains why stretching, the best known and most effective treatment for acute muscle cramps, works. Today's research gives us the ability to understand factors that may play a a greater role in preventing exercise-associated muscle cramps. Understanding these factors will enable us to develop an effective prevention treatment plan, as well as protocol to help identify and help athletes who experience or are at risk for experiencing exercise associated muscle cramps. When we review recent literature and research, the strongest risk factors are as follows. History of cramps, individual cramp threshold frequency, exercise intensity and duration. Let's explain these risk factors further. When it comes to history of cramps, researchers discover that athletes with a history of muscle cramps are more likely to cramp during or after exercise than those who had no history of muscle cramps. In fact, Martin Schwellis reported that triathletes who experienced muscle cramps while participating in Ironman events had significantly higher reported history of muscle cramps compared with triathletes who did not cramp. Researchers also support that the longer the history of cramping, then the greater the likelihood that muscle cramps would occur. Researchers determined that similar results in their investigation of rugby players, a sport that lies closely with football, and they described significant differences differences between players with a history of cramp compared with those without. Individual cramp threshold frequency is also a strong risk factor for the development of exercise-associated muscle cramps. Kevin Miller and researchers out of the University of North Dakota reported that cramp susceptibility is correlated with an individual cramp threshold frequency, defined as the minimal electrical stimulation required to evoke a muscle cramp. They reported significantly lower CTF in participants with a positive cramp history than in those with no history of cramping. Based on this research, it seems that certain individuals are at greater risk for developing cramps based on their cramp threshold frequency. Lastly, and perhaps most, the most commonly understood is the impact of exercise intensity and duration. It seems that the exercise intensity and duration have been the most extensively studied in regards to risk factors for muscle cramps. Researchers note that runners who finish with faster than normal race times are at greater risk for muscle cramps. Dr. Gavin Chang and researchers out of the University of South Africa in, in a 2011 study found that triathletes categorized as cramp-prone had faster overall finishing times. It should be noted that the two groups were matched for previous performance, training, duration, and intensity uh, or frequency before the events. So now that we know history of cramps, individual cramp threshold frequency, and exercise intensity and duration are strong risk factors for development of muscle cramps, I, I think we can sort of focus on some other factors. Uh, family history, gender, and history of injury also uh, plays a small role uh, to muscle cramps. Dr. Yanmik Shang and researchers found that cramp-prone athletes were more likely to have a history of tendon and or ligament injury when compared with non-cramping athletes. They speculate that soft t- tissue injury could trigger an increase in reflex alpha motor activity resulting in muscle cramps. Another plausible explanation is that previously injured areas may be vulnerable to development of premature fatigue due to weakness of the localized muscles. Understanding these risk factors lends us the opportunity to develop effective prevention strategies and treatment plans. My aim is to improve the line of thinking to how we approach this particular issue and to provide both effective treatment and preventative plan. I do believe that it's possible to go through a competitive match and prevent the occurrence of muscle cramps. In this next section, I will provide three suggestions for protocols and three suggestions for acute treatment. Perhaps the most effective place to start is to understand who on your team is at most risk. As a result of taking the steps to help identify individuals with a history of muscle cramps on our team. I've also included information such as frequency of muscle cramps in their past history, as well as their potential for high intensity running and intensity volume. Uh, Provide a simple survey where I ask players questions such as, when is the last time you've had a muscle cramp? How frequently do you experience muscle cramps? Where do you often experience muscle cramps? And I've also included information such as their potential for high-intensity running and volume during competition. This applies to skill position athletes who also play a dual role, such as receiver and special teams. 
uh, and also applies to athletes who are expected to cover a great deal of volume based on gameplay, such as receivers who are expected to run the length of the field or defensive backs who are preparing to repeatedly run the length of the field uh, you know, for, for the purposes of preventing against uh, deep routes. Understanding this information will allow us to determine and be aware of individuals who are likely to sustain muscle cramps and also give us the opportunity to potentially control intensity or volume for their benefits. Since history and exercise duration and intensity are strong predictors for muscle cramps, by simply understanding this information, we can develop awareness for our athletes who are at most risk. Listed here, you can see an example of history assessment and planning sheet to help our athletes during gameplay. The second preventative treatment centers on the use of EM or E-STEM as a method of improving cramp threshold frequency. Remember, cramp threshold frequency was one of the strongest predictors for the occurrence of exercise-associated muscle cramps. Recently, researchers have shown some benefit in the use of electrical stimulation to improve cramp threshold frequency for combating against muscle cramps. In a 2015 study, Michael Beringer and researchers out of the Institute for Training and Science and Sports Informatics in Germany found that two bouts of electrically induced muscle cramps, one week apart, uh, raised cramp threshold frequency significantly for 24 hours in each of the two bouts. This can be a preventive strategy for athletes who have a frequent history of muscle cramps and can center on the use of E-STEM to stimulate cramps 24 hours prior to competition in the efforts of improving cramp threshold frequency and thereby diminishing their potential for exercise associated with muscle cramps. The last recommended preventative strategy revolves around conditioning and corrective exercise. In efforts to improve time to fatigue, preventative strategies can center on improving endurance training. This could bode well for athletes aiming to diminish muscular fatigue, especially for athletes who participate in sports that are based on high intensity intervals, such as football. By incorporating endurance training, sprint athletes may be in better position to improve factors that may attenuate the occurrence of exercise-associated muscle cramps. In addition, training should center on strengthening and conditioning of both multi-joint and single-joint musculature. Muscles such as the biceps femoris may take on the work of a weak or fatigued glute during intense activity, placing the biceps femoris or the multi-joint hamstring at a greater risk for, for fatigue, muscle cramps, and potential injury. Now that we have covered preventative and treatment strategies or protocols aimed at decreasing muscle cramps, it's important to consider effective treatments or acute treatments for when exercise-associated muscle cramps do occur. These treatment strategies are based on the altered neuromuscular theory as a cause for exercise-associated muscle cramps. In terms of the most effective treatment, research has shown that stretching is the best. Stretching is the most effective treatment in relieving acute exercise-associated muscle cramp. It's well documented that passive stretching invokes afferent activity from the Golgi tendon organ, thereby relieving the cramp and decreasing the EMG activity. Should an athlete experience a localized cramp, immediately place the muscle belly and stretch to improve afferent activity from the Golgi tendon organ. The next treatment protocol involves the use of an oral product. Researchers have demonstrated that the use of activators to chemical receptors or ion channels in the body may help to decrease muscle cramps. TRP channels or transient receptor potential channels are an important class of receptors found widely distributed throughout the central and peripheral nervous system. They've been shown to be activated by many stimuli including temperature, uh, mechanical stimulation, as well as ingredients such as ally iso isothiocyanate and capsaicin. These particular receptors are receiving much more attention as potential targets for the treatment of pain, respiratory diseases such as asthma, cancer, and immune disorders. Allele isothiocyanate is an ingredient found in horseradish, and studies have shown that this particular ingredient may have an impact in mediating muscle contractions. Products that include allele isothiocyanate can, can help mediate exercise-associated muscle cramps. Uh, this is a, a quote by... Uh, a researcher, um, oral treatment of exercise-associated muscle cramps using uh, capsaicin and allele isothiocyanate is designed to address the excessive firing of spinal neurons that control muscle contractions. By cutting off the neurons in the TRP receptors, researchers found that they were able to stop the unnecessary contractions before they even sent the muscle, the, a message to the muscle. 
Recently, a company called Flex Pharma has come up with a product called Hot Shot that aims to combat muscle cramps using capsaicin as an active ingredient. Coincidentally, after researching the recent and developed product, uh, several pro teams, including the Sabres, are currently planning to use this product with their athlete. The acute treatment of muscle cramps using uh, activities such as stretching and also the oral consumption of products such as allyl isothiocyanate as well as capsaicin can help really focus our treatment plan on the altered neuromuscular control theory. Some research has also shown some benefits with the use of hyperventilation techniques as a way of mediating exercise-associated muscle cramps, um, and also the use of chirocompression sleeves. Ultimately, my focus today was to provide you with a better understanding of potential treatments that we can have for exercise-associated muscle cramps. Now that I've presented you with articles, research, I think we can get a better understanding of how to tackle this issue when it presents itself. And perhaps by taking these steps, we may find that ourselves in a situation where our star player isn't on the field when we most need him. In the end, my hope is simple. What started as a simple request to use a supported solution for our athletes to a potentially devastating occurrence during field of play uh, has enabled me the opportunity to try and change perspective on how exercise-associated muscle cramps are caused. To realize that certain nutritional intervention practices are limited in their approach and potentially ineffective uh, enabled me to really sort of take the initiative to, pro to provide real prevention techniques and solutions to a problem that is real and near. I hope that after this presentation, we can consider another approach and reasoning to a common issue. I do not espouse any change in limiting or shifting away from hydration studies. I want to make that clear. On the contrary, I re recommend any practice that helps to diminish fatigue, which includes hydration and proper nutrition intervention. Above all else, my hope is that the next time we see a person who suffers from muscle cramp, our knee-jerk response will not be to simply drink more. Instead, we will be able to consider the multitude of factors that may play a role in its occurrence. And as a result, we will be better supplied with preventative strategies and protocols aimed at decreasing the occurrence of exercise-associated muscle cramps.